Ministries Partnership and Assistant Director of the Making History Campaign at Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, I usually work out of our Harrisburg, Pennsylvania office, but like most of you, working remotely. So I am currently at my home in Lancaster County. I want to first apologize because I'm one of those crazy people that got a COVID puppy. So she's in the background gnawing on a bone. So um, I'm hoping that will keep her quiet. Um, but if you hear a random bark, uh, that is why. Um, but I'm gonna get started here with sharing my screen. Just give me one second here. All right, I think you guys should all be able to see that now. Uh, Iris, can you confirm? Yep, looks good. Wonderful. All right. Well, we launched this program in 2018. Uh, Pennsylvania, as you probably all know, uh, provides half of the water to the Chesapeake Bay watershed um, and the Chesapeake Bay. So we have um, a lot of issues in Pennsylvania that we're trying to tackle. And Pennsylvania are in the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has identified trees as the best solution to that problem. So that's one of the reasons that they launched the Keystone 10 Million Trees Partnership. So that launched in uh, March of 2018. I came on around November of 2018. Uh, in the launch, there was about 30 partners, including the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation Natural Resources, Department of Environmental Protection, Farm Bureau. So lots of state partners, agencies, and then local watershed groups and so on. We started out with approximately 30,000 trees being planted. And fast forward to today, we are entering our fourth year. We have about 221 partners as of today, and we are launching our biggest tree giveaway year of over 487,000 trees that we are giving away this year. So we have certainly um, been through our set of challenges over the past three years, um, growing pains, some wonderful experiences, some trialing experiences. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk with Eric Fisher in our Maryland office about the 5 Million Trees program in Maryland. I'm excited for what you guys have to offer. I'm even more excited that your state is sponsoring this program. Um, and so I hope what I'm sharing today will help you guys as you're kind of planning for the future um, and just might give you some insight, some ideas. Um, and I, I hope you guys can just uh, take something from it and hopefully uh, bring it back to what you're working on in Maryland. So we created a roadmap to get to 10 million trees. And this was developed through not just Chesapeake Bay Foundation, but really through the partners. So prior to my arrival, the staff at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation Pennsylvania office sat down with numerous partners that they worked with in restoration across Pennsylvania and said, what are all the ways that you think we can get 10 million trees in the ground? What do we need to do it? How are we going to get there? So they took all of these ideas um, on post-it notes, they put them on the board, they evaluated what were uh, repeats, what were off the wall ideas, what could be um, possible. After that, we did something called a pre-mortem uh, planning. And this is when I came on board. And this is where we evaluated all of these ideas against a set of criteria. So we took approximately 10 different criteria. It was everything from, how does this help us meet the blueprint? What is this cost? Um, does this help us connect with partners? Um, what is the economic uh, benefit value back to Pennsylvania? All these different things. And then we weighted all of these ideas against these set of values so that we could see what actually sprang up as the best ideas when weighted across all of those. And we did that based on two sides of things, increasing supply of trees, of native trees for Pennsylvania, and increasing demand. So making sure we have enough homes for the trees to plant trees. So we went through this process, uh, me, Eric Fisher, and a couple others just sitting at a conference table for my first month. It was a very interesting onboarding experience at CBF, um, but it was really awesome to see what we could come up with, what we could create for this future. 
And it helped us to be able to look at what we could do in Pennsylvania that would help change the course of our future to possibly um, really improve the forecast of what Pennsylvania has done in terms of the nutrient load coming down into the bay. So we came up with several core values. So some of them are direct investments. So we provide free trees, shelters, and stakes to partners. We also provide collaborative grants, um, meaning we have a set of funds uh, set aside that partners can request. So either that could be um, us matching um, a dollar amount towards a project, um, and that could be research that directly is gonna support the projects, or that could be a match towards a grant, like a NIF with INSR grant or something like that. We do offer only those in the watershed, and I specify that because our program actually works across the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, not just in the watershed. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a bit. We also are looking at new funding programs for Pennsylvania, and that's especially important because we don't have as many of the state sponsored dollars as we would like. So we want to look at new innovative ways to bring funding into Pennsylvania. So we're evaluating things like public health benefits. What are ways um, that we can prove that trees reduce public health costs? And is there a way to tie that back to financing? Um, one of the other reasons that we're looking at that um, is because we also have a very large plain sect population. Those would be the Amish that you see driving around in horses and buggies. And many times they will not take funding directly from the government. So we needed to evaluate how we could come up with funding that wasn't tied to government. So that was how to establish new innovative funding. In addition, um, supporting existing tree planting. So what things were already happening out there that we could support? And so sometimes we provide free supplies towards those. Um, we also help support and try and increasing the number of technical assistance providers um, and stewardship. One of the things we're looking at right now is cost share. So how do we order things together to keep the cost of supplies lower? Similarly with trees supplies, are there ways we can um, pool our money together to order more trees? We also work a lot with the industry. Um, that's the nursery industry, the garden industry, figuring out how to make this happen, how to make the supply chain work better, and then deploying an advocacy, advocacy campaign and that's something we've been really working on over the past six months. And this is where we are marketing and advertising to landowners in Pennsylvania, asking them to plant trees on their properties in very strategic locations um, aligned with that Chesapeake Bay blueprint. So really anyone can be a partner anyone being um, someone who's doing some type of restoration work, someone who wants to help us further the mission. So they don't necessarily have to be planting trees, um, but they do have to support the partnership in some way. Most partners come to us because they want the free trees. That's the most exciting thing in the door for them. So they come in wanting free trees and then it kind of grows from there. And so that's really how we've launched the partnership as a free tree program. But it's really grown from there over the past three and a half years. You know, we have partners come in who just want to support. So they just want to help show up at events and talk about what we're doing. They're already planting trees themselves and just want to have those trees be counted towards the 10 million. Um, or they want to help us connect with landowners in their community where they want to prevent deforestation. Um, so there's lots of different ways that partners work with us. So we've tried to, over the years, create different avenues that partners can get connected with us. And that's really where um, some of the learning curve has come in for myself uh, managing the program is to figure out how each of these partners fit into it um, and how to manage each of them within the partnership so that they all feel like they're getting a benefit out of it and feel like they're engaged with the partnership. This just talks here a little bit about why it's so important for us to have 10 million trees in Pennsylvania. You can see we are in the red. We are behind on our nitrogen goals, our phosphorus goals, 
our, our septic nitrogen goals. And these are all the goals that we need to meet to reduce our nutrient load heading uh, towards the bay. So I live in the Susquehanna watershed. Um, we have the Potomac watershed, both running into the Chesapeake Bay. You know, the only thing we're seeing in the green is our wastewater treatment centers. So we are primarily focused on planting trees along streams, mostly on ag areas. That's our top focus of the project. So we're really, especially that first year, we heavily recruited partners that were doing that type of work. So we, from day one, have worked on creating a legacy partnership. So our program actually runs from 2018 to 2025 in hopes that we get to that 10 million trees in 2025. But we've created everything with a legacy component in mind in hopes that after 2025, there's still a Keystone Tree Partnership. There's still a reason for all of these partners to continue the work of either planting trees, helping the trees survive, or helping to reduce deforestation of those trees, making sure that all the work that we've done over these past eight years is going to continue to be a benefit to Pennsylvania. You can see that we also have a lot of evergreen goals. So these are things that we're trying to work on in addition to planting trees. And these are issues that have come up from conversations with partners, um, with nurseries and so on. So they weren't necessarily things that we identified in those first few conversations when we had partners stick post-it notes up on the board, um, for example, tree container recollection. You know, initially we thought we were going to be planting mostly bare root. That's what I budgeted for in the first few years. But then when we really talked about our goals for the program, we realized that as much as we wanted to get 10 million trees in the ground, we wanted 10 million trees to survive in the ground. And in many cases that required larger tree stock. So for us, that meant bumping up some tree stock from bare root into containerized trees. So we end up providing a lot of one and two year old rocket seedlings. So they're typically the um, four inch by 12 inch diameter containers. Well, since COVID, all of the prices of those containers have just gone through the roof. So we've really seen a need to get those containers back to our nurseries so that we can actually keep our costs either at the same or only rising a little bit. In addition, we don't want to see all of that go into the landfill. So there's a dual benefit there. So these are the things that continue to come up that were never part of the initial goal that are just challenges that we have to solve along the way. Maintenance innovation has been a goal since day one, and that's figuring out how we take something that's so expensive. So that's hiring a maintenance contractor, first finding one that can provide the technical assistance to go out to riparian tree planting, which is mostly what we're doing, um, remove the weeds and invasives, um, mow around the site, reset the tree shelters and stakes, care for the area, especially when a landowner doesn't have the time to do it because they're managing crops on their field or, or caring for something else or they're paying for it because they have a CREP rental agreement that will offset some of those things. So it's first finding someone to do it, paying them to do it with the expertise. So maybe it's sending them to something like the Chesapeake Bay landscape um, training. So looking at those things, but then how do we maybe make that easier beyond just training? Is there some type of tech innovation that we can actually provide to them? So we're looking at everything from um, I'm trying to think of the words from drones, you know, is there drone technology that we can use in monitoring? Are there things on the ground that we can make simpler for landowners? Um, and then one of the other things that we also look at is um, tree shelters. You know, we joke and in a not so great way that the amount of tree shelters that we're using to protect the trees means that we're sending tons of giant uh, straws down the Chesapeake Bay with the two backs and planter tree shelters. So are there ways we can either reuse them again um, because the recycling industry has collapsed so it's not possible for us to recycle them properly or is there a biodegradable product that we can use?
So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but we're constantly writing things into this program to innovate. And because of the power of that partnership, expanding from 30 partners to over 200 partners, and just the financial backing we have from donors and from our partners, we have been able to really change the industry and request things of them that I think before we didn't necessarily have that sway behind them. One of those things being what native trees are offered. So um, in 2020, we launched our first forward contract. So this was a pre-purchase of trees to be grown on demand for our projects. So we had been working on this since we launched. It is something we hope to put out in 2019. In the spring, it didn't happen. Fall 2019 didn't happen. 2020 came around, COVID came around, and we're like, we have to do this. There is no better time for us to do this now than when it looks like the economy is on the brink of who knows what, than for us to put this out and give a down payment to growers to grow our trees to say, we are committed. So we have been working with organizations like Arbor Day Foundation, who had done something similar to grow trees for um, wildfire recovery uh, for that project because they had really specific species need and they couldn't find the species. Similarly, here in Pennsylvania, we had really seen in the market, especially from the nurseries in Pennsylvania, a really limited native tree list. And because of the significant ash die off and the elm die off and just everything that's happened with the American chestnut blight and trying to reintroduce some of these genetically modified species, you know, we wanted to see the natives really come back and thrive. So we began working very closely with Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And rather than make our own planting work group, they already had a riparian forest buffer advisory committee in place. This is a program that launched before K-10. It's a group of 80 advisors who work in restoration, who talk all things restoration and plants. So we came to them and said, what trees should we be growing? What do you wanna see prepared for climate change? What species are you seeing landowners ask about? What do you think might be desirable species for a multifunction buffer that would provide nut uh, berry species that they could actually maybe harvest a crop from in the future? So thinking beyond timber value, thinking beyond um, your traditional hardwoods or your traditional workhorse species and looking at a full biodiversity palette, um, especially in terms of looking at blight and disease and, and insect things that are coming in and really um, just decimating our forests, knowing that when we come in and we plant an acre of species, we're telling part or an acre of trees that we're telling partners we want to see a minimum of 10 species per acre so that if something comes in it's not wiping them out. So that's why you're seeing such a big native tree list and I say tree that's tree and shrub. We provide both to partners and then we work with them to try and plant 70% tree, 30% woody shrub, uh, create a nice understory, a nice overstory with lots of biodiversity. So when we put this list in the forward contract to the growers, they came back to us and said, okay, here's what we can grow. So here's what we have access to already, what we're already propagating, and here's the type of seeds we can realistically get. And it was eye-opening for both of us in that experience to realize what seed availability issues we were having. So in addition to a growing issue of what native species were or weren't available. We were seeing a seed shortage issue as well because of seed uh, seed growers or seed uh, collectors simply not being available. People just stopping that way of life, not um, offering that service anymore. And also issues with like acorns for the oak species. So just seeing diseases there and issues with the acorn production. So, you know, constantly trying to balance nature, workforce issues with growing trees. So we wrote a contract out. We agreed to pay 30% down payment on 487,000 trees to be grown. And those trees are what are being delivered this year. 
We have 219 partners, as I mentioned, they're all across the Commonwealth. So um, you'll see on this map here, they're mostly centralized around the Susquehanna River. Um, and that is because of our core goals to meet the Chesapeake Bay blueprint goals. Um, you'll see a lot of them around Harrisburg and that's because that's where most of their offices are centrally located. It doesn't mean that that's necessarily where they're doing their work. You're also gonna see pockets in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia you're seeing a pocket up in Erie, in North Northeastern. And, you know, a lot of people ask us about this. Why are we seeing partners outside the watershed? And that also is very strategic as well, because Chesapeake Bay watershed covers most of the central portion of Pennsylvania, but our two most populous regions, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, lie outside of the watershed. And that is where most of our decision-making power is. So while our capital of Harrisburg is in the watershed, the decision-makers lie outside the watershed. So we work statewide because we are working with partners in the Delaware watershed, the Ohio watershed, the Genesee, the Erie, the Potomac. So we're working with all these different partners because we are proving to our state legislators and our state um, departments that everything that's good for those watersheds is good for the Chesapeake and vice versa. We want to really prove out that trees are good for all of Pennsylvania and can make such a strong difference. We engage these partners in numerous ways. One of those ways is the primary and that's an advisory work group. That's something I had to establish very early on. Um, that's one of my biggest recommendations too within um, starting an initiative like this is to have trusted advisors. And I say trusted versus maybe friendly advisors. Um, you're going to have tough conversations. These conversations are never easy. One of the first conversations that we had to really overcome was how to count the trees. And that's probably something that's going to come up in your, in your case. How do you count 5 million? For us, how do you count 10 million? Who gets the credit? Um, and that gets really tricky on our side of the things because we have multiple donors from, from our foundation side, but we also have partners who are getting funded for various parts. So we might be providing a free tree, but then they're paying for the technical assistance. So who technically funds that tree? Who technically, you know, is the one who counts that tree? These are awkward, difficult conversations. So we had an advisory work group who helped me draft an operating agreement. And, you know, we worked through those conversations. We came up with an operating agreement on the language that we would use as to how we would count the trees, something that we could all agree on as a partnership. And now we're four years in and we're actually reevaluating that because now we have donors who are saying, hey, I actually want you to draw a polygon. We don't just want to point on a map anymore. We want a polygon driven, drawn in ArcGIS to show exactly where that is. Um, and so now we're going back to, the, to those, those same partners and saying, hey, like the point on the map isn't good enough anymore. We really need to get more technical. And four years later, those same partners who weren't sure about, can we count all the trees, even if we're not directly providing it, are now saying, yep, we get it. We're all part of the partnership. We're all working together. Let's update the language. And these things just come from time and relationships and work groups. So this is constantly including people in the conversation. Similar with the planting work group, rather than making our own of our partnership, we kind of outsource that. And so we have a very strong partnership with DCNR. We meet with them monthly. We send any of our tree questions over them for species questions. We also work heavily with them on marketing, just on support. We work with them on, on funding the Keystone Tree Fund and supporting that. We work a lot with our growers, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. We have a messaging and a mindland work group. So whenever we see an issue come, come up, we put together a work group. I say a work group and not a committee. And excuse me, I was very intentional about um, calling them a work group. I want them to work. I want um, partners to come in and know that when they come to these committees, we are expecting that they're going to contribute something other than an opinion, that they're going to come in and we're going to work towards a solution. And that might mean beyond the meeting. So the expectations of our partners are that they complete that online agreement. I'm happy to send a sample of that over if you guys are interested in seeing that. 
updated now is that they agreed to draw a polygon or track trees in our GIS tree tracker. We've had that since the beginning, but that's being more and more developed. And we're actually to the point where now we are providing um, direct logins to every single partner into our GIS. Um, we want them to promote the partnership. We also send landowner referrals direct to them. And there's a whole process for that. So we're asking them to respond to them quickly. We want them to work with the partners with dignity. We want them to adhere to those guidelines. So at the minimum, these are the things that we're looking for. And then when they get to the planting part, when we're asking them to actually plant the trees, we want them to look at these things like streamside buffers. That's our number one goal. Get trees along streams to clean the water. That's, that's our number one goal. We also look at urban and suburban issues dealing with storm water. We also do provide in some cases street trees. In Pennsylvania, that's a much less goal for us since ag is just our number one concern. And then lastly, but not least, is abandoned legacy mine lands. We do provide a lot of trees for those. We do not provide a land or require a landowner agreement. And so that has allowed us to offer trees for agroforestry and silvopasture, which has been really important because in Pennsylvania, NRCS does not fund those programs in Pennsylvania. So that's allowed a lot of landowners to be able to start things like that and pilot those programs. So we work with the partners hand in hand to help them understand what projects we like to see the trees go to and that clean water is sort of that number one guide that we're looking for. One of the things that came up after the first year was a lot of confusion about why and where they should put the trees. So initially when we onboarded partners, we onboarded a lot of partners who um, worked like us. They worked out in the field, they were working on riparian buffers. We had very similar mind uh, mindsets about the projects. But once we started getting partners who were less familiar with ecological restoration, they still wanted to work with landowners and were doing restoration projects, but they didn't necessarily know how to work with landowners or how to go do a site evaluation. So we worked with our own internal restoration staff and with partners, and we came up with a four page site evaluation form. So this is an optional form they can take with them to the field. Um, we don't ask for this back. I do not wanna see all these forms coming in. Um, we ask them to use this as a guide. So we base it on priority regions. So South Central Pennsylvania is our top priority region because it's based on the blueprint goals. But then beyond that, it goes out to the watershed and then the last priority is outside the watershed. And then after that, it's based on site conditions. So riparians number one, urban suburban is number two, mine lands number three, and so on. Again, tools that I'm happy to share with you to look over. Um, and these things have really helped our partners just be more successful in the field um, as to how to work with landowners and what questions to ask. So tools like this are things that we developed on the fly that probably would have been helpful upfront, um, but we didn't know that this was needed until about a year in. So this is a map based on what we're seeing in ArcGIS and what people are putting in. So um, we've provided 492,000 trees directly since we started in, in 2018. What's interesting is this year alone, we're going to be giving away 487,000 trees. So things have really uh, ramped up. In total, partners have planted 3.96 million. So these are all the partners doing collective work. So these are partners like Game Commission and DCNR. These are all of our conservation districts. These are all of these partners working on planting trees, giving away trees, and we're collectively counting towards the 10 million because we're working together. One of the things that we have really been working hard with is our partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection because the Keystone 10 Million Trees program is directly aligned to meeting blueprint goals. We want to make sure that this work is counted to the EPA. So um, we have our ARC GIS program, and it actually filters and reports to a program that DEP uses called Practice Keeper. So we work regularly with DEP once a year, and we help our partners track the trees, 
help them draw polygons, enter all the data through what's called a QAP process, so, so a quality assurance process. We have a set of rules and guidelines of all the information they need to enter so that it's actually reportable data that then we can send to EPA. So it's a project that's reportable and can count for those nutrient reduction loads. That's really important to us to make sure that all of these trees going into the ground actually get reported for the work we are doing in Pennsylvania. That has been a lot of work to develop. So well, DEP has this program for Practice Keeper and they give it to their grantees who are doing the work. Other partners who are doing similar work but don't have a grant, who, who don't have um, a grant with them or who don't, let's say, don't work on this regularly. Maybe they do one, one riparian planting a year their work isn't getting counted at all in Pennsylvania. So we have created this system to allow their work to get counted. So that's why we're now providing these login systems so that every single partner can have their work counted towards the Bay Goals. So that's been a big gap filler for us and we work really closely with DCNR and DEP on that. Um, so that's constantly evolving and we're constantly working to improve that so we can make sure that we're re reporting those goals. So back to that forward contract, when we're talking about launching that and kind of the impact that that has, one of our best partnerships is with our growers. So we work with Octorero Native Plant Nursery in Southern Lancaster County here in Pennsylvania. We work with Aquatic Resources in Southern York. We also work with American Native Plants outside of Baltimore, Ecotone in Western Maryland, Aquaniche um, outside of uh, Perry County in Pennsylvania, and we have worked with both Pikes Peak and, and um, Musser Forest in Western Pennsylvania. So with those relationships over the years, that's how we developed what's called the Grower Supply Work Group. So we started meeting with them early on to better understand the industry. We would ask them just really frank questions about what was happening in the industry, what things we could improve upon with our requests for proposals, what things we could improve upon with our contracting as a nonprofit. Are there things that we could do better to work with the for-profit industry? So when we put out the forward contract, it was um, a combination of things that we count, that we uh, collected from both um, those conversations with the grower supply work group, but with conversations with Arbor Day and so on. And I see you have a question here. We do count the shrubs towards that as well. So those do count, as long as they're a woody shrub, they do get counted towards the 10 million tree initiative. So with the forward contract, when we launched that last year, um, all of those conversations went into it. We released that, we put the 30% down payment on that. So three growers were actually awarded those um, for a total of 487,000 trees. What's great about that is it actually allowed them to increase their operations. So in 2008, I'm sure some of you uh, experienced things where you actually saw some of the nurseries go out of business. So we found with that down payment that several of the nurseries were actually able to purchase defunct nurseries and add them to their operations. So several of them um, expanded operations. So when we did our one year tour of the nurseries to inspect um, the trees that are growing for the program, we saw that they had expanded operations. They had hired more employees. So between the trees and the supplies, including the trees and shelters, we had put in a direct $2.6 million investment for our 2021 and 2022 trees just alone. That's not including the ripple effect of what they invested in their operations, including workforce, including um, supply chain for all of the containers they have to buy, for all of the trucking industry, for delivering all of those things. Things. So we know that there is a huge economic ripple effect. And one of the highest criteria in our program is, are you a grower in Pennsylvania? So we actually do award higher points for those in Pennsylvania. And that's directly, directly tied to an economic benefit because we want to see as many of the dollars stay in Pennsylvania as possible to really prove out that 
it's important that conservation can actually pay, that there is an economic return for conservation. Now, that can't be our sole criteria, obviously, because we have funders, we have public funders, but it is one of the criteria that we look at in addition to a conservation plan, a sustainability and plan, and so on. So you'll see that this is what we look for in a grower. Are they growing native Pennsylvania trees? Are the trees actually being grown in Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic? These are things we also found with working with growers. Some might have an address here, but actually be growing in Tennessee. Um, if you ever had the chance to um, attend um, MANS, the Mid-Atlantic Nursery Trade Show in Baltimore, you're gonna find out that there are a lot of growers who have operations all over and grow their stock in Tennessee or Georgia. Not necessarily a bad thing, but we didn't want our trees coming from warmer climates coming up here at the end of March where we're, we are still experiencing freezing conditions at times and then having the trees die. So that was one of the concerns. Also concerns for adapting the trees towards climate change here. And in addition, keeping those trees um, and the, that money here for Pennsylvania we did ask where they source their seeds from. So looking how well these trees are adapted to our soils, to the issues that we're dealing with in the Pennsylvania climate. So we would ask where they get their seeds from. We asked about sustainability and conservation plans, including what are they doing for their communities? Most importantly, and this is something you guys will have to um, face as well, ability to comply with federal grant and our CBF contract requirements. As government entity and us as a nonprofit, there are a load of federal grant requirements that we have to put into contracts. And not every nursery can operate within those. So that's something up front in a pre-bid meeting that we try to address. And unfortunately, that's where it disqualifies some of those smaller growers that you might want to give and business to, but they cannot manage that kind of a contract. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Bare root growers. We have seen more and more bare root growers go out of business, especially since the pandemic with the workforce issues, and not necessarily go out of business, but be unable to handle the level of um, business that we're giving them. So we're giving them hundreds of thousands of orders and they have to be shipped individually and packaged individually to each landowner. So it's not like they're being sent in packages of 30,000 trees at a time. They might be shipped in packages of 200 trees at a time and they simply don't have the staff to keep up with that. So that's been a challenge for us to face as well. We ask for diverse and women-owned business as much as possible. So right now, what we're doing is we're actually writing our new RFPs for the 2024 contract. So for next year, we opted to just renew our contract. We actually wrote a clause in there that we could renew up to three years, which made it really nice for us coming into this year to go, okay, let's take a breather. Let's just renew the contracts to make it a little simpler for ourselves. But looking towards the last two years of the program in 2024 and 2025, we said, you know, things we're missing. We're missing quality bare root growers. Right now we're down to one bare root grower that we work with, one. We're also missing um, women in diverse owned businesses. It's not that they don't exist in Pennsylvania, but they can't comply with a lot of the requirements. But we were so, um, hesitant to put a lot of risk into this because we were already putting 30 percent down payment onto this forward contract to the growers we didn't necessarily want to put that down payment into an upstart or a, a new business that might fail especially during the pandemic and say here's our money and then we never see it or we never see the product but now that we're heading into our third year of the forward contract we say you know what we can actually be a little riskier this year so we might you know put 400,000 trees with businesses we've already worked with, but maybe we're going to order 100,000 trees only with up and coming nurseries to give them secure contracts to get started as like an innovation or pilot program. So that's something that we're looking at for this year to really try and help them uh, get a start and to kind of change that. As I mentioned, those investments do help them invest in workforce. 
One of the things that we're partnering with is DCNR has a program with the Department of Corrections. They actually have a forestry work camp and we are partnering with their program called the Conservation, the Correctional Conservation Collaborative, where they are learning technical assistance to work on riparian buffers, to do plantings. And we're at the point where we're trying to figure out how when they get released from these programs, we can connect them directly with the growers and with the technical assistance providers to hire them on because they're already trained in these programs and ready to be employed when they come out of it. All right, I know I'm getting a little crunched on time and I wanna leave time for questions. So I'm gonna try and speed through these last few parts. The tree request form is also something we worked on. In the first year of the program, it was just like an Excel spreadsheet. Here, send me your list of what you want. It got really complicated. So one of the things that we've worked on is we now work with a program called SmartSheet. Um, we jokingly call it an Excel sheet on steroids. It's a really amazing program. You can buy a license into it. It's not astronomical. And you can, if anyone's really good at Excel, they can use this program and create forms for themselves. And so this has allowed us to build our own internal inventory of the trees that are coming to us, and then also create forms that people can order the trees. Um, so we have a logistics manager, Eric Livelsberger, I would not be able to run this program without him. So he manages all of these orders coming in and matches those to the trees that we are ordering. And then as soon as those run out, he can take them off the order form. We also have had to learn to open these orders up several months in advance of this season. So that way we can make sure to get these orders out to the growers so that they can line up their deliveries, they can line up their staff and get themselves ready to deliver all of these products. Logistics. Logistics is huge. I could have a one hour conversation just on logistics. So if you get to that point and you're working on delivery and, and so on, I'm happy to have another conversation. I will just touch high level on this in that we have gotten to a point where we do staging districts. We work and partner directly with our county conservation districts. So we ask to borrow their parking lots um, once or twice a year for about a week and the growers come in with their trucks. We have our staff and our partners there. We help manually offload the trucks. Then we manually sort out the orders of trees into individual orders. And we ask the partners to come pick up their tree orders from those staging districts. It has saved us tens of thousands of dollars in distribution charges versus how having those growers direct deliver every single, um, every single tree. The other issue too, is that our growers don't have the capacity to direct deliver everything. So it's a combination of cost and their capacity. So our, our conservation districts have been an amazing asset on that part of things and just in general our partners. So we have those um, set up all across the state and we work with them. Eric works with them every year to set that up on a one-week basis to have people pick up. This does put responsibility on the partners to get trucks, to get volunteers and so on. We've taken it one step further this year with our shelters and supplies. We have two warehouses, one in Duncannon in Perry County, one in York County, where we have at this point over 100,000 tree shelters and stakes that we're moving. This has become a really um, ridiculous operation of getting the supplies um, to and from. And for us, it's me, it's Eric Livelsberger working as a full-time logistics manager and two seasonals. Those are the only full-time staff dedicated to this program. Everyone else works for CBF and they help us um, in some other um, support capacity, but everyone else has other jobs within Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So they help us out as they're able. They all support K-10, which is what we call it, um, but they all have other jobs as well. So we have really put a lot of the ownership on the partners now to come pick up all of their supplies. So we are no longer delivering the supplies as well to the staging districts because that was such a burden on our staff. We are now asking all the partners to pick it up from those, from those two warehouses. That is a change we are starting just for this year. It's the first time we're trying this. Um, 
it was a big change for our partners to accept, to realize that they were gonna have to rent their own trucks, maybe even rent a forklift at their facility to offload. Because up until this year, we have been, or, you know, take, getting all the Penske trucks, the forklifts, doing all of this for them and taking this out for them. So we have had to provide charts to them of what the weights are of each of these pallets of steaks, of these shelters, what the sizes are, so they can figure out what kind of vehicle they need. So um, logistics has been a huge asset. We also have recorded trainings on this. We just had our partner meeting last week. So I would be happy to send you links to the recorded trainings of how we manage our logistics operations because that in and of itself is has become um, just a huge driver of our business. And it is a business. Um, so I lastly, I'm gonna kind of try to wrap up at the end here, increasing demand. So we've worked so hard in these first three years on increasing the supply. So I feel like we've gotten that down pretty well. We've, we've um, gotten this forward contract model. It seems to be working well. Native tree supply is increasing. Our partners are no longer running out of trees um, when they're going to place orders outside of getting trees from us. It's working a little better. But now we need landowners. So we've kind of, excuse me, we've kind of exhausted the number of landowners who are coming to us saying, hey, I want trees planted along my stream. Now we need those next level of landowners who are a little bit less receptive. Those ones who are having problems on their farms, who are seeding, seeing eroded stream banks, who are having a lot of runoff, who are losing soil from their farms, um, who are the ones who we really need to work with. We need to convince them that they need trees along their streams. So we are doing a huge marketing and advertising push. And this is unusual for a nonprofit. So we have partnered with a marketing firm called Swell out of Philadelphia. They have been working, actually taking marketing research that DCNR did, and we've partnered with them. Um, and they've actually done typographies. So figuring out who is our ideal landowner? What are they like? What do they read? What are they doing? And then working with our partners to craft direct messaging to reach out to them. That will start, it's already started on Facebook and social media. Um, you'll see that with 10 Million Trees for Pennsylvania, a slight rebrand from the partnership. Um, but you're gonna start seeing that in all of the Lancaster uh, newspapers and Lancaster farming, which goes out across the state, um, really directly targeting those landowners. And then in the later half of 2022 through Penn Live, which is more of our central Pennsylvania um, newspaper and so on. So that is our next achievement. We are also wrapping up a brand new 10millionTrees.org website, which will allow landowners to directly get connected with our partners through a series of kind of choose your own adventure where they will put in details about their landscapes so that they can actually get matched directly to a partner in their region that provides that technical assistance. That's something you guys might wanna think about ahead of time. It is a labor of love to get there. Um, but this is something that we have seen over and over is that landowners get so frustrated about trying to find the right resources, whether that's through NRCS or their conservation district or coming to the state, there's no one-stop shop. And so our vision from the beginning was, could we create like an Amazon of trees where we could actually get people excited about coming somewhere and getting matched with a partner? So our hope is to drive people to 10millionTrees.org. If you go there now, it's not the site we're going to be introducing. We'll have that hopefully uh, by early March. And then the landowners will actually be able to have that one-stop shop. We're really excited about it. And I think the partners are really excited to see it too. This is a preview. The stuff in the middle is where we're gonna be putting it. Um, help Trees Help You is one of those things, but you know, we're really trying to show them that we want to really help them. We want to see trees as a solution. So it's a very positive message, um, very fun. Um, we previewed it at the Pennsylvania Association of Sustainable Agriculture a couple weeks ago, and we got a lot of really positive reception in landowners from that. Maintenance is our number one goal outside of planting the trees. So we have a huge commitment to that as to why we have partners track the trees. 
One of the last things I want to touch on here, I mentioned earlier on, is that we're looking at the issue of Tubex and planter tree shelters being um, fully uh, plastic and non-recyclable. So we have really been partnering hard to find biodegradable solutions. One of the things we began doing from day one is putting in every single request for proposal that anyone who came to us with a biodegradable tube would be given highest points consideration. So for the first three years, no one had it. No one had an option. Uh, it isn't until this past year, ironically, the first year we didn't put out an RFP, um, that people came to us. Tubex is finally developing a biodegradable tube. Sure Green developing a biodegradable tube. The developer of the Tubex product, his son, coming out with a fully made biodegradable five-year tube made out of wool um, that we are hoping to test and make an order of this fall. We've also partnered with Penn State University, put them in touch with Plantra, out of um, who works out of Minnesota but produces in Pennsylvania to be able to come up with just a new product to use and make tree shelters out of whether that's a waste product or biodegradable. So if you write it into an RFP, it may come. I say that. So if you want something to happen, write it in your RFP and hope enough that if you say it at the pre-bid meeting and you tell your vendors, if you say it enough, it may actually happen. And we're excited that that's finally coming around. I already talked a little bit about the outside the watershed. One of the things we also worked on with DCNR for funding from the state is the Keystone Tree Fund. So now we do have a checkoff box for anyone that has a driver's license or vehicle reg that they can contribute money directly. That comes straight into the state, which is an exciting avenue that's already brought in over $700,000 of funds into the tree vitalized programs direct from consumers from Pennsylvanians who want to contribute towards the work. We also applied for a NIFWIF grant and received that about two years ago. That's a $2 million grant. So what we did is we leveraged a million dollars from our K-10 program and matched it up against the NIFWIF program. So we are offering the free trees towards this, the shelters and stakes. And then in addition, the funding from NIFWIF is helping us to train up new technical assistance providers because that is one of the things that we're really lacking in Pennsylvania to do the maintenance and install. And I also did mention a little bit about what Penn State's working on in maintenance, but we also are partnering with them on a project to send trees home to patients to evaluate how um, they feel, what their, what their uh, blood pressure is like when they plant a tree, and just what happens when they sit outside of their tree. So we're finally getting to the point of looking at what public health and trees actually has a connection for. I know I'm just speed talking at this point, but there's so many different things. And then we also offer a partnership diversity award every year to recognize those who are working in um, unequitable communities to get trees planted in those areas. And I know a lot of the work that you guys in your 5 million tree program will be doing is just that. So this program helps leverage them with $5,000 worth of trees and supplies in their communities to do the work. The CBF is known for their renowned education program. So we have a matching action and restoration program as well that connects students to the K-10 program. I know that was so much information and I want to stop and allow time for questions. Um, so I'll, I'll be quiet so you guys can send them my way. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, I, I know that I would like to request a copy of your growers forward contract, uh, the order form, yep. the training video. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, we have all of this on recording. We record everything we do for our partners to access. So I'm happy to share what's called our partner toolkit that has everything in it. Um, none of it's proprietary. It is meant to be shared with partners. And our goal from day one has been to create something that people can replicate and use. And honestly, I think it would just be an honor for us to see this being used in other states and other programs. Um, you know to see that it's successful elsewhere. 
Where does the money come from for the forward contract 30% down payment that comes from Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, private donors. So we were not able to fundraise, let's say from like an Arbor Day Foundation um, to get the money for that. But we had pro private donors who agreed to allow us to put 30% down to pay them on trees that we hoped would survive. So we did write in the contract um, things like survivability, like if they died through some catastrophic weather event and so on, they would still have to provide trees. Um, but these donors did allow us to put that money down. That has been one of the more difficult challenges, I think, of state agencies. Um, I sit on the US One Trillion Trees Reforestation Work Group, and I know um, Washington State Nursery has talked about that, that they would love to see people do a forward contract model and get orders like that so that they could continue operations at their state nursery, because so many state nurseries are shutting down. Um, but one of the issues is so many nonprofits and state agencies don't have um, a lender or a donor willing to put that kind of, of risk into it. And, and it is a risk. Sally, I saw your hand pop up. Hi, Brenda. It's always good to catch up on the 10, 10 million trees. And I just wanted to know if you had some really, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but just like one or two really key uh, pieces of advice for technical assistance and outreach. And if you're doing anything sort of more, you've had so many threads here. I was wondering if there was a, an attempt to try to be systematic somehow with uh, with um, like your, your, especially your public outreach. Sure. Um, so starting with technical assistance. So the technical assistance part is just sort of getting off the ground. So we just released an RFP for that. Um, we're just in the process of contracting with those technical assistance providers and getting them the training they need to kind of begin um, their work. So right now that's a pilot program. It's running very similar to our tree forward contract where we sort of put the press release out. Um, we let people know this is what we're doing. We have the contractors come in and then the contract contractors are really spokespeople to say, yes, this did or didn't work. And we kind of go through the pilot success of it. Um, actually just talked to Molly Cheatham, who's managing that portion of it. And we kind of shared our frustrations and where I was two years ago with the forward contract of the trees is you put this out and you don't know where you're going to be two years from now because there's so many unanswered questions. Um, as far as this kind of strategic plan with public outreach and so on, all of this is matched to a long-term strategic plan. So we do have an eight-year strategic plan, which follows this all along. The public outreach part of it is we are starting very specifically with Lancaster. So Lancaster is sort of seen as our, our number one target because that's where most of the nutrients are coming from in agriculture. That's why we're testing that out for the first six months to see how receptive it is. And then we'll be able to hopefully do some refining before we go out to the larger audience. In addition, all of our partners are going to be getting postcards, stickers. Um, they'll also be getting flyers. So they'll be able to take all of this out to their own communities and share that message in their communities to be able to test it out as well. And all of it can be refined again. And we do have a, a contract up for renewal with them to work with them additional year to continue that. So it's not like we just come up with the branding, put it out there and then walk away. We've really invested in sustaining that so we can make sure that messaging stays out there in the world. I hope that answered it. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but we have another minute. Or so, if people have any um, anything else they want to ask Brenda, um, I have a, a question. So, I guess when it comes to planning for this on Maryland, there's been a lot of talk of like trying to identify where most of the opportunities are. Um, did you guys do any sort of like opportunity analysis? If so, was it useful? As to where the most trees could be planted initially, you mean? Yeah. 
like wh who's lacking trees? Sure. Um, ours is strategically tied to the blueprint. So we look at um, analysis of where the need is from a nitrogen phosphorus reduction level. So we're looking at the number one places where we need to do that. So our goal from the beginning has been recruiting partners in those counties. So for us, it's those tier one, tier two countywide action plan communities for the WIP, the Watershed Implementation Program plan. Um, so making sure that all of our work is tied very closely to that. Um, in addition to that, we also work with Chesapeake Conservancy. Um, we have um, did start something with them called a tiered buffer program. Um, we have only gotten to pilot it in one county, Center County. And this is where we're looking at sort of non-traditional buffers. So kind of seeing rather than just planting a 30 foot buffer, if we look at, let's say, an entire hillside and look at water path flow analysis to see where we can plant the trees on that hillside to get the best benefit, and then being maybe to being able to potentially tie funding to that in a non-traditional way, maybe through the public health funding. So that's one of the things we're hoping in these last four years that we can begin to puzzle piece together is um, that tiered buffer analysis with innovative funding. Um, so that's one of our long-term goals. Very cool, thank you. Um, anyone else have any other questions for Brenda? And if you can see, um, she dropped her contact info in the chat. So if you think of anything else, um, you can shoot her an email. No, I wanted to let folks know that, you know, we are already working with Maryland Nursery Landscape Grower Association. Um, so, uh, Thanks to the Bay Trust, they started those conversations, you know, some months ago. Uh, but we're trying to round up examples of forward contracting and and the funding, like you know, how do you pay for that? It's not typically how we, as state agencies, pay for stuff. So, anyway, lots of stuff for us to work out. I really, really appreciate um, you taking the time to share your experience. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. See you. And I'll uh, follow up this with some links for you to review. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Brenda. Yes. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Good luck, Thank everybody. Thank you, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Take care.